Uh, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to give you the opportunity to meet three professional soccer players who play for FC Edmonton. So the first person I want to introduce is uh, 28 years old from Huntington Station, New York, Carson Smith. Give him a hand, you can clap. So Huntington Station, whereabouts is that? That's uh, Long Island, New York. Uh, it's a city that has about 200,000 people. Uh, it's about 45 minutes east of New York City. So when I was growing up, I'd commute from Huntington all the way to Queens to play club soccer. So go to school in the morning, and then after school, come home, get ready for training, go train, come back around 8 o'clock at night, and then do homework and go to sleep. How old were you when you started playing? I uh, started playing at four, I uh, started playing travel soccer at ten, and then I started, I joined that team in, in the city around 13 years old. Was there, what point in time did you realize you, you wanted to play soccer as a career? I mean, as a kid, when I was your guys' age, I dreamed about it. When I was watching uh, Arsenal and Manchester United on TV, and but it didn't really become a reality until I graduated college and I didn't know what the next step was. I was like, you know what, I'm going to pursue what I've been doing my whole life. And I went for it, and fortunately, a couple coaches had some interest, and I signed a contract. Do you remember when you stepped on the field for the first time in, in college soccer? Yep. Yeah, it was against Georgetown University in something called the D.C. College Cup. And I came on with about 20 minutes left, and my good friend scored the game winning goal as a free kick and we went crazy because we won the DC College Cup. And So up until, up until that point in time, who had been your biggest role model, um, I guess in the game, in the game, who, who did you look up to the most? My favorite player growing up was the original Ronaldo, so I loved him. Uh, but I, I, I liked a lot of defenders because I ended up being a defender at a young age. At 10 years old, this coach was like, do you want to play striker for half a game or do you want to play center back for a whole game? And I was like, I want to play center back for a whole game. I want to play the whole game. So I liked Maldini, Alessandro Nesta. These are professional soccer players that, during that time period. Someone approach you and say, we'd like you to come play for this team after college. Do you remember how that, what happened next? Yeah, so I played in college. Uh, after I finished my, my last season in college, I went to uh, invite DC United Combine, uh, which is an MLS team. They invited about like 35 players. How old were you? Uh, 20, well, I was 20, uh, senior year of college, and they didn't show any interest. But then I had, my dad knew this French businessman that had uh, relationships with a couple clubs in France. So I basically prepared for a trial in France for the summertime. So I took off in June and I trialed with uh, FC Lorient and this team Chamois Nortai in France for about two months. Didn't work out. Came back and I was, and I went to Vietnam because I heard Vietnam, they paid players pretty well. And my mom's from Vietnam, so it was just kind of like, okay. let me go back. And that was a crazy experience because it was the first time my mom went to Vietnam since she left the country because of uh, the communism took over Vietnam. She escaped by boat. And crazy story with her. So it was the first time she went back in 35 years. You went back together? We went together, me, my, myself, my mother, and my aunt. And in addition, so it was, for me, it was I was going there for soccer, but I was experiencing my mom's, my, and my dad actually grew up there too. So I was seeing the country that my parents came from. And then, but then I had the whole soccer thing, trying out for a team in Vietnam as an American, which was a crazy. This was a whole family experience going back. Yeah, it was a family experience. It was more than just soccer. So that's what soccer provided for me, is these life opportunities, going to Vietnam. I would never went to Vietnam if I didn't uh, try to play soccer professionally. So you got there, what happened? Got there, ended up going to the, the northern part of Vietnam, the city called Hanoi, and Typical Vietnamese, they tell you one thing when you show up, things change. So they're like, oh, sorry, you, you showed up a month too early. Uh, you can train with the youth team for about two weeks and then the first team will come back. So I ended up training with the youth team there. And then there's this youth coach who's like, you know what, I want you to come play with me and my men's team. So I go play with his and men's team. 
I, no one speaks English. I'm the only one that speaks English. I end up playing in this game where it's like the Vietnamese army versus the Vietnamese navy from the old communist regime. They take me out to eat, and I'm sitting at this table. Let me t tell you the story. So I sit at this table with all these Vietnamese guys, and basically this guy in broken English looks at me and he goes, in 1974, us champions, we were champions. And I'm like, okay, okay. And I'm like eating crazy foods. And he goes, we, we play, we stop. We hear plane, we American. Bah, 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 bah. And I'm just like, oh, okay. Cause my dad's an American. But he was born in Vietnam, and my mom's Vietnamese. So like me, I'm like a half American, half Vietnamese. And that during that time period, during the war. I, I, is anybody else? Yeah, that's crazy. Are you <laughs> connecting the dots here? Because yeah. it's New York, it's this college, then all of a sudden it's France, it's Vietnam, and then you're at a dinner with communist guys, yeah. and, and what a great story. Crazy. Long story short, they wanted me to become a Vietnamese citizen because I would have been cheaper. But my mom escaped that country and you can't have dual citizenship between Vietnam and the U.S. because it's communist. So, yeah, yeah. I remember when I was in France, it was the most difficult because I was this, I had a lot of confidence. I played at a good university. I had 70 games. You know, when you're that age, you're not really aware of, the, of what's out there. But when, in France, I realized the, the skill, the competition, and it just was, it opened me, like, I was like, wow. I, it, yeah, so that made me humble real quick. And then, but it made me also realize I really wanted to play pro. What we're gonna do now is introduce a uh, 24 year old, 24 year old player who came to FC Edmonton uh, this year. And ladies and gentlemen, Mauro Esquatio. Did I get it? Yeah. Did you get it right? I was, I thought I was gonna butcher his last name, but uh, Esquatio, right? Uh, no. No. <laughs> no? What is it? Estacio. So, yes, I was born in a small fisherman town called Nazaré in, uh, in Portugal. And after, after a year, my mom asked my dad, I was like, listen, uh, things aren't going well for us right now. You want to, you know, try to immigrate to, to Canada. How old were you? Uh, I was one. I was one. So my dad's like, yeah, why not? So we moved to Canada. So he coming from a Portuguese um, blooded uh, family, soccer is like a religion. So, you know, there's, there's friendships that are determined from soccer. There's just arguments that happen because of soccer. It's just how it is. So I had, you know, at a young age, a very, very big passion for the sport. And uh, my dad had a, has a president, a cousin that's a president at a club. And he's like, you know what? Send him over. We'll give him a look and we'll see what happens. So, yeah, I, I went there. They liked me. Everything really went well. And I was bugging my mom. I was like, I want to leave Canada. I want to leave Canada. I want to go. I want to go play soccer in Portugal because obviously soccer in Portugal is like it's like a religion. Everybody like hockey is in Canada. Soccer in Portugal is something else. So um, yeah, I I begged my mom so much that she was like, All right, you go. But at the same time, she was like kind of heartbroken. So she was like, You know what? You're 11 years old. I'm not gonna see you grow up. Let's all just move back. So the, whole family, so the whole family moved back to Portugal. Mm -hmm. 11 years old, pack up the kids, pack up the car, let's go to Portugal, right? You're in Portugal, and what happens next? Um, after then, it, it was... Sorry? Yeah, so I tried, I tried out the team. I made the team. Um, after that, it was, it was really like... In the, I had to adapt to everything. My Portuguese was, was very, very poor. Um, obviously, the lifestyle, you, the, the food you eat, everything, the routines you have, going not into soccer and learning you know the soccer terms in Portuguese but obviously going to school and learning the language from scratch it was also very very hard for me um, but you know I had the support of you know my cousins uh, my parents and I, I made I made a very very good group of friends uh, at an early stage of my life then and which I still am very close with now so that kind of really really helped out everything and, and like I said like soccer is it's a religion there so once you know how to play soccer once you respect the sport everything just becomes easier because everybody's just willing to help you so I, I have a question so you were you're a Canadian citizen and so you move back and then there's there's from 11 to say 19 you're playing and then you end up on the Canadian U20 national team Yes. So how, how did that happen? So I, from 11 
to, I'd say, 17, I was uh, at the team called uh, Nazarenj, uh, which is somewhat of a local team. They're playing a good, uh, at a good level. But at the age of 17, I got scouted and went to Nyon Bliria, which at that time was a first division team. They had, you know, they were, uh, for soccer-minded people, the coach Jose Mourinho, that's where he started his, uh, his professional coaching career. So it, it was a pretty big club at that time. I got scouted and went to their junior, their junior team. So I was there for two years. My first season, I was kind of like an outsider, but I did very well. I played every single game. Um, I was scoring, I was assisting, and I was playing against big clubs like Benfica, which are in Champions League, Sporting, Porto. I was playing against those, those big teams and things were going well. So uh, my, uh, one of my coaches, his name's uh, Jose Dominguez. He played for Tottenham. Um, Hoffenheim, so he was a, a Portuguese international, and he obviously had connections. And uh, I told him, I told him, I was like, I'm a Canadian uh, citizen. I also have the Portuguese passports. Like, is there anything you can help me with? And he had someone working that was close to him at the CSA. So I was like, that's great. I'll come up with a video. I'll give it to you. You send it over there, and if they like me, hopefully I get you know called up for for U20 camp. And everything happened pretty, pretty quick. It was about, you know, by the time I made the video to sending it, in two weeks I got called up. I met the team in uh, the U-20s in Mexico. And uh, we had two games against Mexico. We normally, Canada against Mexico in youth levels, normally, you know, lose 4-5-1, 3-0. It's always very hard against the Mexican squads because they're very talented. Um, but those two games, we managed to tie the first one 2-2 two, two, in which I played as a starter and I played very well and then the second one we lost 2-1 which I also started that game and played very well so after that I was always you know I kept myself in their minds uh, with my worth at my work ethic and all that stuff so it's it went pretty well. When I was at Union Lydia from the age of 17 to the age of 19 I kind of had to make a lot of decisions uh, you know I was kind of pressured to make a lot of decisions very quickly so at the age of 19, um, I had the opportunity at that time to become a pro for you know, Lydia, playing Portugal's first division. And it, would have, it was honestly what I was working for you know, that whole time that I was there. Um, unfortunately, the club went through some uh, money issues and they went bankrupt. So I went from you know, dreaming every day of signing a pro contract and playing first division at the age of 19 to all of a sudden not having a club. So I was bouncing around in Portugal, traveling, you know, one hour this way, two hours the other way, and uh, I didn't really find a club until August, which in Portugal is late. Uh, no normally teams start, you know, June, beginnings of July, their preseason. So in August, everybody's set up, they're ready to, you know, to start the season. So I was lucky enough to, to, find, to find a team in uh, in Portugal about an hour and a half away from where my parents were so it was nice um, so yeah I started preseason there started playing there and I got called up to another U20 camp which if I'm not mistaken was in Costa Rica uh, the coach at that time was Nick Dasovic and he had an assistant called Phil dos Santos which also was Portuguese kind of the same story Portuguese parents he was born there came to Canada got involved in the soccer in Canada so he, uh, he was the assistant coach. And obviously, we kind of hit it off right away because I have a Portuguese background, so does he. So it was, it was nice to have someone like that there. Um, so, so yeah, I, I played, played that tournament. Obviously, got always kept in contact with him. Um, I had, I'd say, six good months at my team in Portugal, Sporting Pombal. And then uh, all of a sudden, my phone rings and he's like, listen, uh, my brother is, there's a franchise opening in Ottawa. My brother's going to be the coach. Do you want to come over? And my intention initially were like, go to Canada, first year team. Is that what, like, is that what I want? Because I obviously made my whole family <clears throat> go to Portugal for soccer. And then I'd be ditching them kind of to come back to Canada. So obviously I talked to my parents and at that time it was a professional contract so I, I told them, I was like, it's what I want, it's what I want to do for the rest of my life so I think it's, it's the right time. So my mom was obviously kind of disappointed, she's, she's very like protective and you know, she 
hates being away from myself and my brother. Um, so it, it's been a tough four years for her, but I think it was, it was the best decision. Uh, I signed with Ottawa three, four years ago now. And um, yeah, I was very happy. It was a very good three years for me. The uh, guy we want to introduce is uh, 25 years old, born in Los Angeles. This is starting his third season with FC Edmonton. And he is El Salvadorian national team member, Dustin Curry. Sensing another journey here. So LA, Portland, El Salvador, somehow you end up at FC Edmonton and there's a whole bunch of stuff in between. So so is your family originally from El Salvador and how what, how did they all get to LA or how did that happen? My dad is from El Salvador. My mom is from Nicaragua. Uh, and they moved, my dad moved in 84 to Los Angeles uh, from El Salvador. There was a civil war going on, so him and his three brothers left to Los Angeles to start a better life. Uh, my mom moved three years later, uh, and luckily they lived in the same building, and at, 90, at the year 92, I was, I was born, so they just came together out of nowhere, but that's what it is. That, a lot of that is in uh, California. It's a lot of different ethnicities, El Salvadorian, Honduran, uh, Guatemalan, Nicaraguan. It's very diverse, so uh, it's a little bit of everything. It's almost as saying that you're in Central America when you hear Los Angeles. It's a very multicultural place. I started playing when I was four years old. Uh, didn't get really serious when I was about 10. I would have to go to, it's called Thousand Oaks. It's a city in uh, Los Angeles. It's about two hours away from downtown, and I lived uh, downtown, so I would have to go uh, travel and play with, uh, <laughs> I don't mean it's in any bad way, but with Caucasian, with white kids, because I didn't, <laughs> my, my experience was, I, I lived in an area where it was just, if you were not Latino, then you were African American. So after school, you traveled to I would have to go Tuesdays, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. I have to leave right after school. Get on my uh, with my mom. She'll have my uh, clothes ready, and we'll drive out there. And we did that. We did that. Sorry, we did that for about five years. So, and uh, in 2015, I moved to Portland. Uh, my family tells me it was because of my dad, a job for my dad, but it was mostly because they wanted a better life, especially for me. I was heading down a a not so uh, good path. Uh, it's very common in uh, Los Angeles with gangs and uh, things of that nature. And I lived in a very, very dangerous uh, neighborhood, South Central LA, which is known for its, its gangs and its shootings and stuff like that. So they wanted a better life for me and my sister. So uh, how did you get yourself into the soccer culture in, in, that, in the Portland, Oregon area? Uh, my, my, I was fortunate enough that my dad's brother had uh, already moved down there. So his son, uh, my cousin, was already playing in a club soccer team out there. And so he said, hey, Dustin, there's a club team here that you can play for. Uh, the, I think he was, he was 17 at the time. And he said, it's a U15 team. And give it a shot. So I went, on, I went into the tryouts. They asked me, are you good enough? And I'm not gonna say, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I just said, I just want an opportunity to see if I can make the team. If not, then no, uh, no worries. So I went in, practice, and then after that, not even an hour, and they said where I could, if I could already play with them uh, for the weekend. And yeah, after that, it just took off. I did ODP, which is uh, Oregon. Uh, yes, it's, it's ODP is for where the best players in the states. I think Carson had ODP also. The best players in the state come together, then they play against a region, uh, regional team, which is the best teams in like the West Coast, uh, which is California, Las Vegas. They get the best players from them, from that uh, region, put them together and play other regions. And I played in that, then I joined the national team, the U.S. national team. Uh, I was, when I, my first national team camp, I was about 15. Uh, that helped me though with college. I didn't go to college, but that helped me in the, in the fact that I got opportunities from very, very big time schools offering me full rides to go to college, to come attend 
uh, they were gonna pay everything. So it, uh, the national team helped me a lot. And then at 17, I moved to Florida to play with the national team, the under 17. By yourself? I moved by myself, yeah. Uh, it was a big academy called IMG, which holds about the best athletes in the world. Uh, Maria Sharapova goes there, Serena Williams goes there. And the US soccer team had their own section, their own area. Uh, we lived there, we woke up around eight, go to practice, come back around 11, uh, grab lunch, go to school. So while everybody was at school, we were at practice. Then they had afternoon classes for us because we weren't able to attend the morning ones. So yeah, I mean, I did that for two years. I did the U17 national team uh, qualifiers in Mexico. Uh, after that, I came home, finished my senior year in Portland, in my high school. Did, you know, played soccer there. And after that, uh, like I said, the emails or letters continued about going to college, but my mind was, pretty made up about, about what I wanted to do. So how did you make the leap to, how did it happen that you ended up on the El Salvadorian national team? Um, so my dad is El Salvadorian and they, the El Salvador Federation already had an idea of who I was okay. because uh, I'm a Salvadorian and they see a potential if maybe US doesn't want him, then you can come play for the El Salvador national team. So. They emailed me, I went down, I practiced with them. Uh, after that, I did a U20 camp for the national team of Salvador. Uh, played in the qualifiers for the Salvador. Uh, appearances with the national team, is that right? Yeah. And you also played in Aztec Stadium. Yeah. How many people, that was, was that the Gold Cup? Uh, no, when I played in the Aztec, in the Azteca was when I, we played for the qualifiers, for the actual men's World Cup qualifiers. Yeah. So how many people were there? It was like 80,000, 65,000. 65, Do you remember being in the tunnel, getting ready to come out? I remember, I remember getting to the stadium and not hearing anything because we have to be there about 90 minutes before the game. It's just a rule. But then when we came out to warm up was when the whole environment just changed. It was just, it was crazy. It's something that, you know, if when you think about Azteca is Central America, or I think in the Americas is probably the biggest stadium, like most known stadium. A lot of players tend to crumble in the sense of they get butterflies, their feet start getting wobbly. The fans are literally almost from here to where you are. Uh, and the Mexican fans are not the nicest, you know? Um, but that experience is, is one of a kind. It's one that I will cherish for the rest of my life because I have a lot of Mexican friends that saw the game, uh, that were obviously rooting for Mexico, but they said, man, at the end of the day, it's, it's crazy to have a friend that I grew up with in high school and middle school, and now seeing them play in the Azteca, you know, it's, it's incredible. And so the atmosphere was amazing. Uh, if you're able to play in front of 65,000 people, 75,000 people, I don't think that 10, 15 yeah. should, should scare you or forget a moment like that. The idea behind this is to make sure that you have access to lessons in leadership that can inspire and motivate you. And from this point forward, uh, you're connected. You're connected to these three men up here. You're connected even greater to our club. So I'd like to thank the three of you for sharing your time with us. I know it's valuable. And, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us, especially ripping in off the field. You know, we really do appreciate your time here today.